Welcome everyone to another episode of Indie Reads Aloud Radio. This is where we invite independent and small press authors to come on the show once a week and read a little bit from their books. Today, James Michaels is joining us. He's a Michigan native and uh, we're going to hear a little bit from his crime thriller. James, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. So, James Michaels was born and raised in Southeast Michigan. Even when he was a child, he loved to read and had an active imagination. Some of his favorite reading topics were true crime and crime fiction. In 2015, he joined the Department of Corrections as an officer. Currently, he lives in Michigan and enjoys reading, playing video games, watching movies, playing pool, and exploring new places. I'm really pleased to have you here, James. This is this reading today is the first time that we have shared this genre with our listeners, so I'm really pleased to have you. Uh, I'm honored. Thank you so much. Um, would you give us a little bit of the synopsis? for your story. It's The Ballad of Johnny Carlo, right? Yes. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about what this story is, just to give people a reference? Sure, of course. So The Ballad of Johnny Carlo is it's a crime fiction slash romance between um, Johnny Carlo, who is a hitman for the mafia with his own code of honor. However, the mafia itself is merging with these other large criminal syndicates across the country to create pretty much this crime conglomerate. Okay. And with their increasing ruthlessness, his code of honor is coming into conflict with it. And after a series of events, it's, you know, there's one event that it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And Johnny says he's had enough and he decides to run away and he runs down to New Orleans, Louisiana under a false identity and to try to live a, a straight life. Then you have the other main character who is Leisha Abraham and she is a homicide detective with the New Orleans Police Department. You know, beautiful, tough, honest, you know, no nonsense, smart. Um, she's investigating a series of gangland slayings between two warring gangs. One of whom is headed by her father. And, you know, as fate would have it, Johnny and Leisha meet. And it's sort of like a different variation of Romeo and Juliet. These two people who were on opposite sides of the law, they meet and the attraction strong and they fall in love. Sure. But but unfortunately... But it's, a, it's a forbidden love. Exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, the that crime conglomerate, that super uber organization, it has its sights set on New Orleans. And Johnny and Leisha happen to find themselves at the top of their hit list. So it's a question of, will they... You know, will they defeat all their enemies, walk up into the sunset together, or will they be buried together? Got it. Wow. That sounds like an intense storyline. I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit of it today. You're going to read the synopsis and chapter one for us, correct? I mean, not the synopsis, the prologue and chapter one. Yes. Okay, excellent. When you are ready, James, please read aloud. Okay. All right. The Ballad of Johnny Carlo, prologue. How would you choose to die if it was up to you? Really think about it. Every detail. Where would it be? How would it happen? When? Who would do it? What's the weather like? Living his whole life by taking it from others. Johnny Carlo had thought of that question a million times and came up with a million different scenarios, ranging from the most likely to the most desired. In all that time, of all the different imagined situations, the real deal turned out to be more beautiful than any of them, and he was grateful. Let's paint the picture. The rain came down hard, a hurricane that had lost most of its power was reduced to a moderate tropical storm. It was the dead of night. Aside from the dock lights, everything was shrouded in darkness. 
in the shadows, the rain droplets rushed back into the ocean like children rushing back into their mother's arms. The dock was in southern Louisiana, just off the Gulf of Mexico. Johnny was drenched, standing there on the deck, but he couldn't feel the rain. He couldn't feel the wounds that he had collected from the earlier events that night. In fact, three of his five senses were dead. This was a conscious choice. He put all of his concentration on hearing the voice of his killer and staring into her dark brown eyes. He prayed that he could go into oblivion, carrying with him the sound of her voice and her incredible beauty with him forever. And she had never looked so beautiful. In fact, she became more beautiful every time he saw her. As he looked past the barrel of the gun into her face, he saw something he had never seen before. There was no anger or hatred. There was no sadness, though she had reason to show it. It was judgment, like that of an avenging angel. And now it is time for Johnny to be held accountable for his sins. He was ready. What could be a better death for Johnny Carlo? As he looked into her eyes, he said what he had told her a million times. I love you. The pistol was aimed for his heart. She would not miss. As her finger gripped the trigger, she had told him what she had told him a million times. I love you too. And that's the end of the prologue. Chapter one. We're getting ahead of ourselves. That is how the story ends. Let's go back to where it began. Interestingly, it starts like how it ends, with a death. Giovanni Angelo Carlo, known as Johnny, sat at his booth, continuously checking his gold Rolex watch in between taking bites of his T-bone steak cooked rare. Something the matter, asked his concerned companion from across the table. Film form is showing heat at midnight, Johnny replied. I was thinking of taking Aurora to go see it if we got this done on time. How can you never take me anywhere nice, asked the other man jokingly. Because you never put out. Well, pay for your meal here and pay for mine and your luck might change. And Johnny laughed. Forget about it. Aurora would kill me. The other man laughed too. His name was Vincenzo Lupo, though he went by Vincent. To call him Vinny would be a mistake. The two men, both Italian, had grown up together and had been best friends for as long as they could remember. Both men were in their early 30s. Johnny's 30th birthday having taken place a month before and Vincent was just short of 31. Both stood at six feet, two inches. They were incredibly handsome, though in different ways. Johnny, a second generation American, was of Northern Italian lineage. Most of his ancestors having lived in a village just west of Milan. He had pale skin and blue eyes. His facial features were oddly more that of an Englishman than an Italian. However, his hair was black and smooth, which he kept combed back and ran just past his ear. Cardio, weightlifting, and kinesthetics had chiseled his body to rival that of a Greek god. Vincent, on the other hand, had pure Mediterranean characteristics. His hair was black like Johnny's, but more wavy and so long that it reached his shoulders. He also had a devoted workout regimen, but his body was leaner. Vincent's grandparents were from Palermo in Sicily, so his skin had a natural tan complexion. But what May didn't know was that one of his ancestral lines, that of his mother's grandfather, came from Saudi Arabia, giving him a darker skin tone than most Sicilians. While the few people close to these two knew them as Johnny and Vincent, the streets knew them as the Surgeon and the Shadow Man, two of the most feared hitmen on the East Coast. Johnny was named the Surgeon for his surgical precision in his hits, gifted with an amazing accuracy in firearms. He also had a talent for taking out specific targets without witnesses or collateral damage. Johnny saw extra bodies as sloppy work, and he took pride in perfection. Vincent felt the same way. He had gained his nickname as the Shadow Man for his preference to strike at night. Stealthy and deadly, his targets never saw him coming. Vincent and Johnny enjoyed working together, though they were both perfectly capable of pulling off hits on their own. However, every now and then, a special case would pop up that would require them to work together. Levon Crawford was a special case. He had blatantly defied the Argento crime family by refusing to pay them tribute. That wasn't bad enough when an emissary... A made man was sent to deliver a final warning. His body was found riddled with bullets in his car. An example had to be made. Not only was Crawford to be killed, but his whole operation was to be dismantled. Anyone who was, who was with Levon when they came for him was to die too. A lot of bodies means a lot more problems, Johnny thought. He didn't like the idea of going to Levon's home turf and potentially getting into a firefight. But this is why both him and Vincent were called in. Lady Blood, the third of their group, widely known as the trio, would have been invaluable to have on this assignment, but she had a prior engagement. How will we know the guy when we see him? Johnny asked. Get this, Vincent replied. Idiot likes to wear these expensive shades whenever he go, wherever he goes. Vincent shrugged his shoulders. 
I must think it makes him look cool. Fantastic, Johnny said sarcastically. Vincent chuckled and shook his head while finishing off his chicken Alfredo. Then they heard the bell above the front door of the diner ring, signaling to the wait staff that another customer was walking in. Johnny glanced at a light-skinned man with a set of Ray-Ban sunglasses stroll up to the counter. Prior due diligence had told them that this guy was always sent on a food run to this diner. At least they have good taste, Johnny thought. The steak was delicious. He looked back at Vincent. That's him, he said. Vincent nodded and signaled for the pretty redheaded waitress to come with the check. He gave her a hundred and told her to keep the change. Then they got up and headed for the door as Ray Van was waiting for his order. And they provided them with the cover of darkness. Both men were also wearing dark clothing, Johnny in a black sport coat, dark gray t-shirt, dark blue jeans, and black boots. Vincent had on the same color jeans and boots, but his t-shirt was white under a black hoodie he had zipped up as soon as they walked out. The parking lot was full, so Johnny took up the north side while Vincent went to the south. Ray-Ban had to have parked his car somewhere. Turned out to be on the southern side. He made his way to a red 2015 Toyota Tacoma with gold rims. The poor bastard hadn't even gotten all the way inside when a masked man punched him in the face and pushed him into the truck. Ray-Ban's face landed on the floor of the passenger side. That's when the door opened to reveal a second assailant holding a Keckler and Cock USP equipped with a silencer. The second man then placed the business end on the side of Ray-Ban's skull. What the fuck? He shouted. Shut up, commanded Johnny. What's the passcode to the door? I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Fucking kill, Vince said coolly. Johnny pulled the hammer back. Wait, wait, pleaded Ray-Ban. It's 1945. Johnny looked up at Vincent. You believe him? He asked. I believe him, Vince replied. Johnny looked back at Ray-Ban. Thanks, and he pulled the trigger. As he put the gun back in the shoulder holster under his jacket, Vincent grabbed the shades and put them in his pocket. Johnny stared at him in confusion. What? Vincent asked. I like them. Johnny shook his head in amusement. Fantastic. Levon Crawford patted his itchy head so as not to mess up the cornrows. He took pride in his appearance and treated any sloppiness with a borderline obsessive compulsive manner. His beard was trimmed neatly, his clothes ironed, and his fingernails manicured. Fashion was also important. Levon needed the newest of everything, the newest Timberlands, the most crisp Levi jeans, fresh Nikes, and ever-expanding collection of jewelry. His favorite piece was a silver pendant shaped like the continent of Africa. His current favorite coat was a Brooklyn Nets varsity jacket that hugged his lean six-foot-two frame. Though average-looking facially, his dark complexion, shape, and flashy attire had earned him an entourage of women. He obtained the income to keep up with his expensive habits, too. Harlem has maintained a strong market for the heroin trade since the time of Frank Lucas and Nicky Barnes. During the last year, Crawford muscled his way for a significant portion of market share. Now he ran the fourth largest heroin operation in the neighborhood, and he had the potential to be top dog. Undoubtedly, this ruffled the feathers of the old guard, who had for decades maintained a solid relationship with an even older organization, known widely as the Mafia, or La Cosa Nostra. Levon stood in the dining room of the apartment, staring at the half-dozen naked women, four black and two Latina, packaging up the dope. Being a professional, he never partook in the product himself, but the same couldn't be said about his conduct with the women. Four of them he had already slept with, and judging by how close the last two were to each other, he bet he could get them at the same time. A radio playing, Today Was a Good Day of ISQ, was on the windowsill. Behind him in the living room, his man, Oil, was sitting in the, on the couch, counting money with another associate on the coffee table, while Payton Full, starring Wood Harris and Kai Pfeiffer, was playing on the TV. Well, you always gotta be watching that fucking movie when you're playing the, when you're counting the money, he asked lightheartedly. Man, this shit gets me in the mood for counting these stacks, Oil replied. Don't you ever watch the ending? Good thing it's just a movie then. Fuck it, Levon thought. Oil never messed up the count, so if that was his way of getting it right, who cared? A fourth man was currently using the toilet in the bedroom past the living room. On the other side of the door leading to the outside hallway, another man was posted in case anyone decided to get cute and rob the place. Not that Levon was worried. His operation was solid. He would try anything. Levon took a second to reflect. His life didn't start off easy. His parents had given into the temptation to crack, both of whom were now serving lengthy prison terms for a gas station robbery that ended with the clerk getting killed. That was years after his mom's brother had adopted him from them at the age of seven. His uncle, however, was no square. The man had a serious reputation on the street and was still a force to be reckoned with. If you're now a believer of personal choice, you'd think it was inevitable that Levon would go down the road he was on. But Levon regretted, regretted nothing. He was smart and almost all, was almost a legend already at the age of 22. The world was his oyster. 
His train of thought was interrupted by the timing of his iPhone. Checking the caller ID, he smiled slightly to see his cousin's thing pop up on the screen. He pressed accept and put the phone to his ear. Hey, baby girl, he said warmly. When are you going to stop calling me that? She said over the phone, slightly irritated. I'm your older cousin. I'll stop when you stop calling me big dummy. Then stop being a big dummy. He laughed. Levon and his cousin grew up close. They were more like siblings. But things had changed. They had gone down different paths, though she didn't know the extent of his involvement in streets. He was once a, Levon was once a small-time numbers runner back when they were living in the same house. When he moved away, they were barely able to see each other, aside from the rare vacation. Still, they made an effort to keep in contact with each other. How's the old man doing, he asked. You know him. Nothing ever changes with him. That bad, huh? It was her turn to laugh now. Well, how are you doing, she said, after she was done. You know me, same old, same old. That's what worries me. Just making sure you're staying out of trouble. I'm always okay, cuz. Well, just remember that I'm always here if you need me. Levon turned to the girl so the girls wouldn't see him wipe a tear from his eyes. Cousin was the only person we ever truly loved. Thanks, cuz, he said softly. I love you. I love you too, she replied. That's when he heard the beep of the keypad accepting the code. Jaleel was back with the takeout. I gotta holler at you later, cuz, he said. Take care of yourself. You too, she hung up. He put his phone back in his pocket, slipped into the living room. Levon would never leave that room alive. Nice place, Vincent said, admiring the architecture of the project building. At least nine of the windows were boarded up. Vines grew onto the walls like nature was trying to reclaim some territory. And you could almost smell the mold. Makes you want to leave that little shack in West Village an upgrade, Johnny joked. The town home? Yeah, who needs it? Look at this place. It even has its own security. He gestured to the man standing by the front door. Along the sidewalk were rows of larger, large hedges. A dim street light provided a low-rent spotlight for the man. He's definitely for security for something, Johnny said quietly. They were standing on the other side of the street under a tree that reduced their visibility. For our friend we've come to see? I'd bet on it. He's caring. Johnny could tell by the bulge of the man's shirt. He was tucked in his pants. And he tended to grab it every now and then, probably to make sure it was still there. He could be a problem. Well, he's with our friend, so he's got to go too. Johnny took a step forward from where they stood on the other side of the street. Vincent gently grabbed his shoulder. This one's mine. You'll know when it's clear. He started walking down the left of the sidewalk. After getting out of view from the sentry, he crossed the street and disappeared into the shadows. Johnny tried to look inconspicuous. He'd kept the jacket in the car they had borrowed for the job. A jacket that fancy would draw some attention in the kind of neighborhood they were in. The ski mask was in his back pocket. He glanced back over the sentry and had almost missed the show. A shadow emerged from behind the hedge, behind the guard, and grabbed him. Both his hands gripped his throat like he was choking, and Johnny knew that Vincent was using a garage. Vincent pulled the man back into the shadows behind the hedge. After a moment, only Vincent stepped out into the dim light. That was the cue. Johnny crossed the street, rejoined his friend and partner in death. They put their masks back on. The project building was five floors. Their target was at the top. It only took a minute for the two killers to silently climb the stairs all the way to the fifth floor. Another man stood outside the door of Levon's apartment. Before he knew it, Johnny had circled around the top of the stairs and dropped into two silent shots. One to the heart, one to the head. Then they strolled over to the door and entered the code on the keypad. A green light appeared and the device beeped its approval. The door was unlocked. As they calmly walked in, they saw three men sitting on a couch directly in front of them while a movie was playing. None of the couch potatoes had even turned to see who entered. Loud music came from the kitchen out of view. Johnny and Vincent both carrying their silent pistols. Vincent wielding the same model that Johnny had, riddled them with bullets into the back of their heads. The assassins were so fast that none of those idiots had any idea what had just happened. Oh, shit, cried a voice to the right of them. Another black man wearing a Brooklyn Nets varsity jacket, whom they instantly recognized as LeVon Crawford from a photo they were given, had come in from the kitchen. When he saw them, he went for his gun at the small of his back. Before he could pull it out, Johnny put two rounds into his stomach. LeVon clutched his stomach and dropped to the floor. Vincent broke off and went to the right and into the bedroom. While Johnny was keeping an eye on the wounded drug dealer, he heard another door open from where Vincent had gone and then heard another silent shot from his friend's pistol and the familiar thud of a body drop. Vincent re-entered into the room. Johnny grabbed Levon roughly and propped him up so he was sitting. Levon grunted his pain as Johnny grabbed the gun from the small of his back. Now that he was disarmed, the men walked into the kitchen. Because the music was turned up so loud, the six women didn't hear the ruckus that occurred right in the other room. They had no idea anything was wrong. 
until they saw two armed masked men almost waltz right in. Terrified one of them screamed while the uh, two others broke down crying. Another begged for the men not to hurt them. Johnny and Vincent looked at each other. They weren't animals. And collateral damage was for amateurs. They looked back at the women. You ladies have a nice day, Johnny said. And he and Vincent made room in the doorway for the women to leave. As they rushed out, Vincent slapped the last one in the ass. Once they were gone, the only people left in the apartment were the two hitmen and the man they had come to kill. Now it was his time to go. They found Levon right where they had left him, laying on the ground, watching his own blood pour out of him. As they stood looking down at him, he glared right back up at his killers. What the fuck you bitches waiting for? He asked as he spat blood. Why didn't you just waste me as soon as you came in? Had to make sure you were the last one to go, Viz replied. Shouldn't have fucked with the powers that be. Should have remembered your place. Fuck you, I won't beg. Just do it. Kids got heart, Johnny said admiringly. Gotta give him that. Sure, Vincent conceded. Johnny raised his pistol. Don Argento sends his regards, he said. He fired and the bullet went right between Levon Crawford's eyes. He was no more. That's the end of chapter one. Wow, that's pretty intense. Thank you so much for reading for us. That was, that was, now I need to go out and get that book. So, so tell me, James, what was your favorite part about writing this book? Um, you know, I would have to say, um, definitely kind of creating the different multitude of characters. You know, I mean, you have Johnny Carlo, who is just this cold, calculating person with you know, at the end of the chapter that I just read, you notice that he does, you know, he, he does have some sense of honor, you know. Sure. Um, I love uh, Alicia Abraham. You know, she's just this, like, she's probably, yeah, she is, like, the most, I don't want to say the most good, but for lack of a better word, I'm just going to say that. She's, like, the most good character Um in the story, right? Sure. This and this is a have... story with a lot of layers of gray, so right. Um, it 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 would be kind of interesting to to uncover the different layers between good and bad and everything in between. That sounds right. like a lot of fun to write. Yeah, yeah definitely well, was. Thank you so much, James, for reading for us. And anyone who wants to find your book or follow you on Facebook, all of those. Uh, links are in our show notes. Thanks so much, and I hope when you write your next book, you will come back and join us again. Oh, most definitely. Excellent. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.